Good morning, everybody. I won't uh, take much time to tell you how the Global Consciousness Project uh, data are achieved, but basically it's a continuous report of data from something like 60 locations around the world um, where the data are random number generator uh, trials. The bottom line of the experiment um, really gives quite good evidence that there is some effect on these random number generators um, and we calculate that effect during periods of time when people are stimulated by some trage tragedy or um, maybe a celebration to um, feel the same emotions, think the same kinds of thoughts. In other words, we're looking for global events that gather um, people together and uh, then and when we look at um, repeatedly such events, we find that there's a very small but ultimately quite impressive difference from what's expected from random number generators. The odds against chance are on the order of trillion to one that we get as much deviation as we do. Now Peter Bansell, my uh, friend and colleague um, who lives in Paris, is um, the person who's done more analysis on this data set than anybody else in the world. And up till a, a year, a couple of years ago, he was pretty much convinced that, there, uh, that the best explanation might be some sort of a field, uh, even though he couldn't describe it or write equations for it. In the meantime, he's been doing further analysis and has come to the conclusion that because there are a couple of uh, factors that he really can't see any way for a, um, a consciousness effect to get to the bits and change them, um, that we need a different kind of model. He says a consciousness field can't penetrate the exclusive ore we use to protect the data from bias. And furthermore, uh, something that you might think of as a global consciousness um, isn't something that could have intention. And the, uh, the, that uh, both of those are assumptions, I think. In any case, he concludes that the GCP results must be a kind of goal-oriented or experimenter effect and gives some pretty persuasive arguments why that's the case. Among them, for example, looking back at um, data which we never analyzed for um, certain kinds of events for example, the solstices, and finding that the unexamined solstice periods did not show nearly as big an effect as the ones uh, which we had selected to do analysis. So the kind of um, counter arguments I think are pretty you know, straightforward in a certain sense. I think basically we're uh, probably asking for too much to um, uh, to conclude that we know how psi can or cannot work, um, the, the assumptions that he makes about um, not being able to penetrate the XOR or that um, intention has to be um, a part of the equation, I think are vulnerable. Um, Jim Carpenter's first sight theory says we're basically doing something like uh, psi all the time, whether we're conscious of it or not. But the real best argument is that there are quite a few things about the data, uh, elements of structure that simply don't fit very nicely into a goal orientation. The formal prediction, generally speaking, will do so. But what if we look at uh, something different from the formal prediction which the experimenters have made? Um, in the case of 9-11 data, we had a, an effect, but it was only 0.03 probability for the formal prediction on 9-11. Uh, it turns out that when we did a, a broader exploration, exploration, we discovered that the uh, ex same effect that we're looking at persisted over three days. A different kind of um, effect, a different kind of variable, not uh, the subject of a prediction. Um, in other words, a kind of independent measure also shows an effect, even though there was no prediction in the Experimenters had no intention of looking at that when the original prediction was made. Here is, I think, a, a, an interesting one. I think we'll hear more about Burning Man later. But in 2006, I decided to look at this interesting uh, case 
um, which had been going on for quite a while. I had data for eight years, and when I looked at the data, I was, I was startled. <laughs> there it was a huge effect, and again, nobody was thinking about it. There was no hypothesis. This is a retrospective analysis, and the only way this could be explained by as an experimenter effect would be for that to be something like retrokinesis, I, I think. <laughs> And it, this is a result of one of uh, Peter's analysis, very um, I interesting and important in the context of whether a global, uh, excuse me, whether a, um, um, a, a goal orientation model can explain the data. Here in the darker line is our uh, standard measure. That's the uh, prediction we always make. It has to do with a correlation of uh, the data from separate pairs of uh, devices. There's an independent orthogonal comparison that uh, shows pretty much the same trend. It has a smaller effect size because the variance is larger, but it's, um, a, again, a completely independent kind of thing. We um, have data that uh, can be looked at um, with many different kind of questions in mind. One that we can ask is, does distance have any effect on the outcome of the, in this experiment? And the answer is a kind of interesting qualified yes. We can't, we talk about distance, uh, we can only do a, a reasonable analysis where the distance we're talking about is the separation between pairs of REGs. And that distance, that, um, uh, the effect is a function of the separation of these REGs. Um, I have a poster session, by the way, so I can explain these things in, in more detail. Uh, this gets interesting because it happens only or ma mainly for the smaller, what you might call local events. This one I think is a beautiful analysis again from uh, Peter Bansell. We ask um, what's, the, um, rel what's the relationship of um, the effect size to the time of day? So it turns out that when we're awake, uh, the global consciousness effect size is a little bit larger than it is when we're, um, when we're awake. It's larger than when we're asleep. The peak is around dinner time, five or six in the afternoon. The valley, the l least um, effect size comes um, at three in the morning. And at the bottom of the graph are our control data, of which we have huge amounts. <laughs> um, and they show no such effect. Here's one that's sort of um, a kind of logical argument you know, when you think that psi is something like regular stuff. <laughs> um, modeling shows that some, there may be some percentage of true negative outcomes. In other words, even though we predict it will be the, the outcome will be a positive deviation, it turns out that within the database, about two-thirds show that about one-third show a an, an no question null effect, and about, I, I'm, I'm not that many, uh, about 17% show the, the null effect, and another 17% show what you th can think of as a kind of true negative. Okay. So um, maybe we, and we could say there's psi missing, but I'm not sure that if you go that far that you'll be able to sustain um, an argument that a goal orientation or experimenter effect is fault falsifiable ultimately. So I think there's um, definitely something going on with the experimenter. We, after all, we create the experiment and we know things like uh, in physics that light is a wave or a particle depending on how you ask the question. But I think the ex it's pretty, pretty clear from a lot of experiments and the people here are familiar with that the experimenter is, is involved in creating part of the subtle um, effects as well. And um, in any case, I come to the conclusion ultimately that um, there are lots of aspects of the GCP data which aren't compatible with uh, e either kind of experimenter effect. Instead, for those, we need something like a field-like um, model. Apologies for the uh, misalignment. So on balance, I, I think we have to understand that psi is neither just an experimenter effect, uh, goal-oriented, nor is it necessarily uh, what we might think of as the nominal source. It's not either or, but I think both.
Thank you. Thank you, Roger. Okay, we have time for questions. Roger, do you, uh, have you compared the effect sizes of the GCP with, say, other goal-oriented um, experimenter um, psi to get a sense of, because it seems like the a field effect, it would be sort of a different kind of effect, and therefore the, the effect sizes might be different. We, have, we haven't actually done any kind of formal comparison like that, but I, I think um, it's clear that the global consciousness effect is really small. Mm -hmm. It's about one-third of a standard deviation on average. So that means that a great many of the trials you make will show um, no effect. Um, it's a good question, but it's very difficult to ask because we have, um, at least nominally, um, maybe millions of people involved in um, uh, different, uh, you know, positive and negative kinds of uh, circumstances. And um, I'd, like, I'd like to talk with you sometime about how one might go about making that comparison. I think that the distinction between the field effect and the experimenter effect is a false dichotomy. Not only is, I, so you, I think you massaged it a little bit by saying there, there appear to be both effects. Um, I'd go a step farther and say both effects are the same thing. Uh, in that when you have a stochastic process and you apply intention to it, you're essentially programming a psi system. So your intention is that the Global Consciousness Project should work to measure global events, and so it does. So you genuinely are measuring global events and field effect, but you're doing it because you've mentally programmed it to do so as the experimenter. And I, I don't think there's a dichotomy here. I don't <laughs> think there's a problem. Well, in so I have to agree with you in large uh, part. But I'm a little worried about the um, unfalsifiability of that kind of extension. If you allow yourself to go that way, when do you stop? This, this is the challenge of psi. We don't know where the psi is. Yeah. Uh, and uh, I've, I've got several experiments in which I programmed machines to produce a certain effect, and then those machines did it. Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> Were they experimenters? Of course. <laughs> Uh, were the machines experimenters? Yeah. Uh, that's another question. Yeah. <laughs> I feel a little bit obliged to defend uh, Peter Bensel's uh, conclusion that there can be no global field effect. And uh, his major, and one of his major arguments you didn't show here, um, and it, it, it goes as follows. These RNGs uh, all over the world, they have a slight misalignment in times. Uh, if you, and he did a reanalysis uh, trying to uh, get all these uh, timing uh, exactly the same. And if you do that, so you shift the signals of each of these uh, RNGs a little bit so that they now they are simultaneously. And if you do run the analysis then, the whole effect disappears. That shows to me that in some way there cannot be a field, and at least that's his conclusion, there cannot be a field because why would that be so uh, dependent of the, the accidental misalignment in time of the RNGs, that, that's just crazy. And um, I should add that he, is a, he was a strong believer and, and, and a supporter of global field, so uh, his conclusion is against his own worldview. Mm -hmm. So uh, I think uh, his conclusion is uh, correct. So please comment on that. I have, um, I have no doubt that um, I, I really love what Peter's been doing all these years. It's revealed a great deal about the data. But the models that he uses are, as he will say, and you know, very simple field models. So seems to me to be, to be entirely possible that you have a more, let's say, robust in the sense of powerful field model that can affect um, um, not just this one second synchronized moment in time, but a period around that time. 
I, I'm not, I don't want to uh, spend time now uh, debating at length, but let's talk about it. Um, hi, I'm really sympathetic with the global, I, I'm like the X-Files, I, I want to believe in the global field um, <laughs> idea. But um, whenever I look at those small effect sizes, I, I keep thinking that they're, I want them to be bigger. Uh, and I keep thinking that maybe unintentional uh, influences on, on RNGs are very similar to intentional influences, such that there are some very few skilled people and they're the ones who are basically dragging the effect, and everyone else has zero effect. And what do you think about that? Um, I'm not exactly sure um, what the bottom line question is. It's, the bottom line question is, do you think it could be the case that the tininess of the effect size is because you have skilled people who don't know they're skilled, this is unintentional psi, who are basically producing the entire effect, and it's washed out by a ton of well, um, people who aren't skilled. In the context of the idea that it's an experimenter effect, um, there are a few of us who, who know a great deal about it, and uh, most of us think we don't have any personal experimenter effect uh, potency. But um, in terms of uh, all those people out in the world, they're completely unconscious of you know the one. Right, this would be people who are skilled at unintentional psi. So in other words, I'm, I guess I'm drawing a parallel between intentional s PK, like, like at the pair lab, right? Yeah. You have people who are skilled at an intentional micro PK. Yes. And maybe there's an, a rule that there are some people who are skilled at unintentional PK. I, I don't think I can answer the question. I'm, uh, okay. I'm not sure I understand it. But uh, basically, the intentional side in the lab is, is also an extremely tiny effect. And it, um, it, it's... Um, attached, you might say, to only a few people, about 15% in the pair right. uh, data set. Um, there, may, there may be a tremendous amount of unconscious psi going on in the part of the experimenters that set up the whole operation. I get, yeah. Okay. I'll talk about it later. Hi there. I just want to read something uh, in response to uh, your co-author's uh, quote, global consciousness does not have intention. Uh, just one sentence here from the Yoga Sutras. Um, uh, let's, uh, nothing can be predicated a purusha, uh, uh, which is global consciousness in yoga theory, um, except as a corrective negation. No positive attribute, process, or intention can be affirmed of it. Uh, so no intention can be affirmed of it, though it is behind all the activity of the road. I just want to submit that does these great thinkers from millennia uh, have been like chewing on this stuff uh -huh. daily and uh, maybe they'd be useful this stuff thank you all right thank you Roger as you know um,